Years of covert Cold War era nuclear weapons testing is now free to watch online. The Defense Department has now declassified roughly 750 high speed films. Dozens are posted on a National Security Lab's YouTube page. For decades, these films were gathering dust and decaying. Researchers have been hurrying to convert them to digital before they decompose too much. These clips are just a small portion of the more than 10,000 taken of atmospheric bomb testing from 1945 to 1962. Besides preservation, the footage has been converted to digital for more in depth analysis. Back when these tests were done, researchers were calculating by hand. Computer analysis has now shown a lot of the original data was wrong. Some answers were off by 20 to 30 percent. The weapon physicist who's led the conversion effort says accuracy is important to keep the U.S. from using its nuclear arsenal. He said, if we show what the force of these weapons are and how much devastation they can wreak, then maybe people will be reluctant to use them. Concerned about a Russian military buildup in the Baltic region and its western borders, Germany's top diplomat has warned about a new arms race. Russia's stationing of ballistic nuclear-capable missiles in Kaliningrad was not raised by Sigmar Gabriel during a news conference with his counterpart, but speaking on his first visit to Moscow as German foreign minister, he acknowledged Russian and NATO deployments. My worry is, as we face the debate on the size of the armed forces, for example on Russia's side, and in the Baltics and in Poland, the debate in the U.S. about the exorbitant increase in its military budget, that we're again facing the danger of a new arms race spiral. The West and the Kremlin remain at odds over Ukraine. NATO suspended all practical cooperation with Moscow after Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014. The Russian foreign minister wants to get back round the table, but not to talk repeatedly about Ukraine. Let sit down as part of the NATO-Russia Council, but instead of repeating pro-Ukrainian, pro-coup as I would put it claims, let's start working on what it was created for. Let's focus on European and Atlantic security. He urged Germany to abandon what he called groundless claims about Russian cyber attacks, and with WikiLeaks revelations about US spying in the headlines, Lavrov said he avoids having his smartphone with him when negotiating sensitive subjects so as not to be listened to by the CIA. A rare glimpse of Western Mosul. Urban warfare on a momentous scale. Caught below hundreds of thousands of civilians. This is the place where IS proclaimed its caliphate. Here it was born, and here Iraqi forces say it will die. On the ground, they are advancing, but struggling to hold what they capture. They pound IS positions. Then frantic gunfire towards a threat overhead. An IS drone may be carrying explosives. They manage to shoot it down. Well, this is as far as we can go for now. As you can hear, there's a lot of gunfire in the area. There are snipers in position on this street. We have cover here, so we won't be moving from this position. But within the last half an hour or so, we've heard three car bombs going off in the distance. We've also had a lot of incoming mortar fire. You can hear now the sounds of battle. The IS fighters that are in this area are putting up fierce resistance. This is what's left of Mosul Museum, once home to a priceless collection, much of it nearly 3,000 years old. But now it's a monument itself to Islamic State's brutal destruction. It was not something they attempted to hide, posting videos of the destruction online shortly after taking the city in 2015. The artifacts, they said, were images of idolatry and should therefore be destroyed. But it's now merged, not all of them were only the ones too heavy to move. This Iraqi officer explains how many of the smaller items were looted and kept by the group as a potential source of income. While the museum has now been liberated, fighting still rages nearby. There may not be much left of Mosul, but it's a battle both sides are desperate to win. 
the Syrian crisis is the worst man-made disaster the world has seen since World War II, the UN's top human rights official says. In a speech at the Human Rights Council, Zaid Rad al-Hussein called for an end to torture, executions and unfair trials. The Syrian government delegation did not comment at the Geneva meeting, but has previously denied allegations of systematic torture. Ensuring accountability, establishing the truth and providing uh, reparations must happen if the Syria, uh, Syrian people are ever to find uh, reconciliation and peace. Uh, this cannot be negotiable. Detention remains a central issue for many in Syria, one which may determine the fate of any political agreement. His statement came as a UN commission on Syria accused the country's air force of committing war crimes. One example given involved the alleged deliberate bombing of the Wadi Barada Springs, which cut off water for 5.5 million people near Damascus in December. Both Syrian government and rebel forces blame each other for the attack. <laughs> A booby-trapped letter exploding in the face of a secretary at the International Monetary Fund's office in Paris on Thursday. The woman triggering an explosion as she opened the envelope, suffering non-life-threatening burns to her face and arms. It seems that it's a pyrotechnic device or a big firecracker, something rather homemade. It is by no means a bomb. The building was immediately evacuated, armed police swarming to the scene in central Paris. Employees allowed to return inside just hours later. IMF chief Christine Lagarde condemning the explosion as a cowardly act of violence. Nobody has yet admitted to sending the letter. Package of explosives found in his ministry in Berlin on Wednesday. That's according to mass circulation newspaper Bild on its website. Police have not confirmed that it was addressed to Wolfgang Schäuble, only that it did contain explosives and was aimed at causing considerable injuries. It was found in the mail sorting room. A finance ministry spokeswoman declining comment except to say an investigation has begun. Relations between Turkey and the Netherlands are on shaky ground amid a growing diplomatic spat over Turkish campaigning in Holland. After the Dutch government barred Turkey's foreign minister from landing in Rotterdam, the row reached new levels late on Saturday night, when the Turkish Family Affairs Minister was prevented from entering the consulate. Dutch broadcasters reported that Fatma Batul Sayakaya was detained before being escorted out of the country. She had travelled to Rotterdam from Germany after the Dutch authorities revoked landing rights for the foreign minister. She insisted on entering the consulate to address roughly 2,000 people who had gathered outside for a rally to support the constitutional reforms that would extend President Erdogan's powers. It is to be put to a referendum vote in April. The latest developments follow a fiery war of words, with Erdogan branding the fellow NATO member a Nazi remnant for barring the foreign minister's rally, while the Dutch Premier responded that the comments were crazy. Numerous people have been injured in clashes between protesters and riot police in Georgia. 
Demonstrations over the arrest of several men over unpaid parking fines turn violent in the Black Sea city of Batumi. Protesters gathered in front of a police building demanding the release of the drivers. The Interior Minister was quoted as saying those involved in the violence would be punished. But then, apparently attempting to calm the situation, he reportedly said the arrested men would be released. Thousands of people have taken to the streets across Brazil to protest against pension reforms. The government wants to raise the retirement age as part of its austerity program. It says the measure is essential to help lift the economy from its worst recession in more than a century. Tens of thousands of demonstrators, however, backed by powerful unions and the former popular president, Lula da Silva, have pledged to fight the controversial proposals, which are expected to be put to Congress in the second half of this year. The demonstrations reflect the deep ideological divide among Brazilians, but President Michel Temer has received the backing of senior lawmakers, despite the expansion of a corruption probe that threatens the ruling coalition. Ten people have been injured in a volcanic explosion when magma from Italy's Mount Etna flowed onto snow, bursting and sending shrapnel flying. Etna is Europe's most active volcano. These pictures all taken in the last month. Emergency services say none of the injuries are serious, but the wounded included members of a television crew filming for the BBC. Rescue workers seen here racing to the scene. A BBC correspondent on the shoot writing on Twitter that they had to flee burning boulders and boiling steam heading down the mountain. Etna has been quiet for years, then blew into action again last month, sending plumes of lava into the air. Lava is known to explode when it makes contact with water, or in this case, snow. Their bodies are limp and unresponsive. Their limbs dangerously thin. The children of South Sudan among the most at risk in a crisis the UN says is unprecedented. We stand at a critical point in our history. Already at the beginning of the year, we are facing the largest humanitarian crisis since the creation of the United Nations. The UN estimates more than 20 million people across the region are facing starvation and famine, in countries scorched by drought and unrelenting conflict. It turns out two separate faults in Southern California really aren't separate after all. A new study discovered the Newport Inglewood and Rose Canyon faults, the majority of which are just off the coast of Southern California, are really just one continuous fault system, and it's capable of producing an up to 7.4 magnitude earthquake. That puts the Newport Inglewood and Rose Canyon fault more on par with the famous San Andreas fault in terms of predicted earthquake strength. Even though we witnessed the San Andreas Fault trigger a devastating earthquake in Los Angeles via Hollywood Magic in 2015, the last major quake in that region actually occurred in 1857. Researchers investigated part of the San Andreas Fault that runs north of Los Angeles and found that large magnitude earthquakes occur on average there once every century. And the U.S. Geological Survey found the fault could be overdue for another. We're well past the 100-year mark, and the USGS says there's a 16% chance an earthquake with at least a magnitude 7.5 will occur in the area within the next 30 years. The last major earthquake to strike along the Newport Inglewood and Rose Canyon fault zone was in 1933. It was a magnitude 6.4.
da frente pra lá, que tudo que tinha casa, essa beirada aqui. Aí eu gritando, corre tia, que a barragem vem, que ela olhou pra cima, a gente vinha aquela onda em cima da gente. Você está em trabalho por dezenas e dezenas de corrupção. Você tem consciência tranquila que as doações foram legais e que não influenciou em absolutamente nada na minha posição. A few bricks are all Jose Remaicuna could recover from his ruined home. After 12 years living in the town of Tambo Grande, all his possessions have gone. He's glad he saved his family. The water came from behind like an ocean wave. I grabbed my children and ran out and the wall fell over. We almost got cut underneath it. Then my whole house collapsed. Almost everyone here is affected by a month of floods. More than 30 families from this neighborhood are living in makeshift tents at a bus terminal, waiting for help. The mayor of Tambo Grande had to go to Lima, the capital, to look for aid because the regional government doesn't have enough resources to help these people who've lost everything. Municipal leaders here say some communities remain isolated and others in danger of more flooding. We are banging on the central government's door and international organization for help to clean up the drains. We only have one crane. The whistleblower website WikiLeaks has published details of what it says are hacking tools used by the CIA. They're said to include malware that targets a variety of operating systems. The UK's MI5 agency is said to have built a system of spyware attack that targets Samsung televisions. The CIA would not confirm the report. There was no immediate comment from the Home Office. Could your TV be spying on you? If you've got an internet connected TV, that might be possible. Secret documents show how the CIA have turned TVs into bugging devices, giving the capability a code name, Weeping Angel, named it seems after characters in the Doctor Who TV series. A team of security researchers showed me how they've replicated the CIA's capability. So how is it possible to turn a TV like this into a bugging device? Well, modern TVs are basically powerful computers. They've got lots of processors on there, but most importantly, they've got microphones and internet access. So we've written a little application here. The screen's almost blank. It listens to everything we're saying and sends it off to a third party. Hopefully not the CIA. Once the app's installed, it makes it look like your TV is off when it's actually on. We've infected it with malware, and now we've got a microphone here that listens to anything you say. Hello, is anyone listening? Hi, TV. It is possible that your TV is being used as a spy, as a big brother in your living room, but how likely is it? The leaked documents show that the CIA worked with Britain's MI5 to develop this capability to target specific individuals. MI5 won't comment, but surveillance is a key tool in its work to catch terrorists. Bugging buildings and cars is something it's been doing for decades. The latest digital technology simply offers new ways to do that, and they say to keep us safe. For the CIA, the leak of hundreds of pages of documents is certainly embarrassing, highlighting its failure to keep its own secrets. And a former head of the agency told the BBC the leak would have consequences. Two Russian spies are among four people indicted by the United States over the hacking of 500 million Yahoo accounts in 2014. The indictments unsealed during a news conference in Washington mark the first time the U.S. government's criminally charged Russian officials for cyber offences. The defendants targeted Yahoo accounts of Russian and U.S. government officials, including cybersecurity, diplomatic and military personnel. They also targeted Russian journalists, numerous employees of other providers whose networks the conspirators sought to exploit, and employees of financial services and other commercial entities.
The FSB intelligence officers are Igor Shusin and Dmitry Dokuchayev. Incredibly, Dokuchayev is reportedly behind bars in Russia on charges of state treason for allegedly spying for the U.S. Yahoo said when it announced the attack that it believed it was state-sponsored. The two other suspects are a Latvian-born Russian national and a Canadian citizen born in Kazakhstan. He's in custody in Canada. A federal judge in Hawaii has issued an emergency halt to President Donald Trump's revised travel ban, blocking it hours before it was due to come into effect. The order would have placed a 90-day restriction on people from six mainly Muslim nations and a 120-day ban on refugees. Opposers say it's discriminatory. I mean, that's a big reason why Hawaii brought this case, is because it's, it's really uh, something that uh, that hits us to the core. If you have uh, an order that's coming out there that's taking us back half a century to a time when there was discrimination by nations of origin or by, by religion, um, that's something that we, we have to speak up against. President Trump insists he's trying to stop terrorists from entering the US and described the ruling as unprecedented judicial overreach. This ruling makes us look weak which, by the way, we no longer are, believe me. Just look at our borders. We're going to fight this terrible ruling. We're going to take our case as far as it needs to go, including all the way up to the Supreme Court. No fascist USA! Last week, there were more protests in Washington against Trump's latest executive order. An earlier version, issued in late January, sparked anger and confusion, and that time was blocked by a judge in Seattle. No! Biologists filmed the sick saiga antelope as it struggled to breathe and stay on its feet. Eventually it succumbed, one of many, to the symptoms of a viral livestock plague called Peste Petit Ruminant, or PPR. More than 4,000 saiga have died since goats and sheep in Mongolia first caught the disease last year. Scientists think the disease was spread from China. This morning. Field biologists and rangers could do little to contain the disease in the wild, beyond collecting and burying carcasses, while vets vaccinated domestic animals. Greenpeace has released video of the Great Barrier Reef, it says, shows mass coral bleaching for an unprecedented second year running. Climate change, it says, is fueling warmer waters off Australia, cooking the reef alive. Bleaching occurs naturally, but scientists are concerned that global warming is magnifying the damage, leaving underwater ecosystems unable to recover. The pictures add to evidence already gathered by a Queensland government agency and an American scientific body. The reef is on an official UNESCO watch list. Grounded again. Hundreds of flights have been cancelled at Berlin's two airports, causing further misery for passengers already hit by industrial action last week. Ground staff have downed tools once more in a dispute over pay. Initially a one-day walkout, it's now been extended to Wednesday morning. I feel like I've been taken hostage. I'd like to fly on holiday and, as always with rail strikes and other strikes, those who suffer are the travellers. Even have uh, the balcony for information open, so I'm just sitting here waiting for someone to to show up and and hopefully get some more information than the one we already have. That is no airplanes today. Ground staff jobs include checking in passengers, loading and unloading planes, and directing aircraft on the tarmac. On Friday, the last strike led to the cancellation of nearly 700 flights, leaving tens of thousands of passengers stranded in the German capital.